Worldwide, an estimated one in three women will be physically or sexually abused during their lifetime. That's well over one billion women. In Australia too, one third of women will experience physical or sexual violence, and the Pacific region has some of the highest rates of domestic violence in the world. According to the 2012 World Development Report on Gender Equality, between 60 and 70 per cent of women in Kiribati, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu report experiencing domestic violence. Those statistics are staggering, and of course they're only the cases that are reported. What are the human costs of violence against women, globally and in the Pacific? What can be done to address this often silent tragedy and change attitudes towards women and domestic violence? Well, there's many, many factors, but probably the one that we would single out as being the most influential is um, gender inequality. Uh, when there's not a belief in gender equality, that the um, surveys that we've undertaken in Australia, we've got some quite good data on this now, um, indicate that there is a very significant link between men who do not believe in gender equity and men who perpetrate violence against women. And of course, when we're talking about violence, violence can go both ways. Women can be violent to men and men to women, but it is hugely disproportional men towards women. And of course, in physical um, violence, uh, there's significant more damage. By and large, we'd say it's absolutely everyone. Mm. And we support the statistics that um, you used in the beginning. In Australia, we're pretty confident that it's one in three women have been victims of physical violence. One in five women are victims of sexual assault, but also very significant is one in four children have witnessed um, domestic or family violence. Mm. Domestic violence per se happens at family level and it sometimes is not very visible because it happens in very private spaces within the family space. So you find that there's a woman who's experiencing violence. Um, she's a professional like ourselves. And in the morning when she walks through that door, nobody knows what happened in our house last night. And she perseveres and suffers in silence for a very long time. There are those women who will speak out because they've been empowered and encouraged to do so. And there are those ones who don't even realize that what they're undergoing in their private spaces is actually violence. Fanoto has uh, surprisingly um, seen a, a very high level of uh, uh, emotional violence. And it's something that we have not um, addressed in our 20 years of work specifically. Can you define emotional violence? Emotional violence is when you feel threatened, uh, you are worried, you, you psychologically, you don't have a punch in your face, you don't have a slap in your face, but something has happened that you, you walk around as, a, as a, a person, a female, or a person that has an eyes open, but inside you it's almost all dead, because nobody's seen what you are going through, maybe because of controlling behaviors, controlling actions, uh, so it's, it affects you psychologically. Women are made to believe the gendering process at the beginning of the time that when they are born, made to believe not to talk about what they, their feelings are, how they are feelings every day. So, uh, and people take that as that's part of culture or people call it culture. And women uh, in some cultures back home, uh, at, at wedding day, you are told what your roles are and that you cannot take out what you experience in your house out of uh, out of your house so they they literally live with with what they go through every day because they believe and had made to believe that that's culture and i think for us who have been working in this in this um, space for a while we know that there's such a lot of interconnections between economics leadership ability to make decisions um, and and violence I would say there's also, I think, some very important principles that underpin this initiative um, of the governments through the aid program. And the first principle is around that we cannot impose change from the outside. So the success of this program is, is based on how the um, assistance can be used to support indigenous and local endeavours to achieve positive social change. I think also there is a very strong principle around the multidimensional nature of gender inequalities, the complexity around that, that when we're talking about change in this area, we're, we're talking about change, generational change, so things that take time. 
And I think the third principle is really being very clear about what the role of a donor is, uh, like the Australian government. Um, we, we can use the aid program to uh, act as a catalyst in many ways, to support local action. Uh, the main players here though are women like Marilyn, organisations in the Pacific, Pacific governments, but the Australian aid program can be used in a very intelligent and creative way about how we support uh, local drivers of change, because that's how change will occur. Uh, the program itself will be delivered through partnerships, so that partnerships will be a big part of this program. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll agree that um, this, is, this is everybody's business. Um, and we in the Pacific are yet to catch up with uh, everybody's business. Um, the women's uh, movement is uh, spearheading this work. And like Carol said, uh, principally women's rights groups are, are doing a lot of work in this area. And realizing that we've been working with women for a long time, and they come back and said, yeah, I can change, but he, he still doesn't allow me. So therefore, we began looking at how we can involve men. To change anything, we need to engage men. And this is, um, it's been a very interesting experience in Australia over the last 10, 12 years to increasingly work with um, male leaders. And we're already seeing very great benefits from this. Um, We've, the White Ribbon Campaign is probably the, the major um, contribution to this, where I think we're now close to 2,000 um, White Ribbon Ambassadors, men who feel strongly about this as an issue and are prepared to stand up. Um, we've now uh, got quite a, a lot of um, ambassadors leading a sort of micro campaigns within their own communities. And I think that our big gains actually in Australia were made because of work that we did in the early 2000s when we started the White Ribbon and we got um, really worked with parliamentarians. And just one example of that is that um, Kevin Rudd became a very enthusiastic White Ribbon ambassador. And when he came into won the election in 2007, one of their party platforms was, along with the person who later became the uh, uh, Minister for the Status of Women, uh, Tanya Plibersek, came in with a platform that they would put in place a national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. But it took the, the Prime Minister leading this was a phenomenal um, achievement and I know that women who've worked in uh, Australia over decades to do, um, to take action and bring about change, uh, one of them in particular I remember saying I never thought in my lifetime I would ever hear a Prime Minister speak about violence against women that way, saying it is we the men who are responsible for it, which is what he did. Mm -hmm. And we now have, this is growing, we've got a group of, of men very, very actively involved and we have linked it with um, the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women, the 25th of November. So we're leading into that now and already we're seeing a lot of action take place. But in the work that we are um, putting together, our national plan, the, the most important part of the prevention policy is that communities must be safe and that we need to have leadership in the community and white ribbon for men taking some role in that. It's not just parliamentarians, it's people in sporting organisations, faith-based organisations, right across the community, that they have to be prepared to stand up and do something. When institutions want to work on women's rights or addressing violence against women, women need to be part of those political processes or governance processes where decisions are made on practical actions and strategies and resourcing of efforts towards violence against women. The power to change, the ability to influence change lies with the local people. So what we've done working with women to actually engage in working um, with uh, the people who are actually the conflict actors themselves has been movement building. So building collectives of women to have a stronger voice to articulate their marginalization and violence and, 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 and the, 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 how they experience the conflict and what they think are the practical protection strategies that work for them. So women's, building women's collectives is one strategy. We felt that you don't create an individual program for an individual community. The principles that we talked about broadly 
also need to be targeted at specific communities, um, but with an enormous amount of participation from that community and um, input from that community. But some communities are overrepresented, unfortunately, and we certainly are using um, language, culture, a, a whole range of things, working mainly through community leaders, but, but and also through faith-based leaders. And another avenue is uh, getting um, in, in, in insertion into constitution at a high level to uh, allow for, for relevant and appropriate legislation. Uh, it's, another, it's another tool for uh, dealing or a strategy to address violence against women. So when it is in the constitution, the government is held accountable to provide appropriate legislation and also administrative measures uh, to, to enhance that, uh, that, that situation. Um, and again, yes, I'll, I'll support that we, you need appropriate uh, qualities. Uh, how do we speak to parliamentarians? How do you get into a minister's office? What do you say when you get there? Those things need to, for us to build our, the, women, the women's capacity. One of, some of the interesting spaces we've had is creating an environment where we have women, local women, and the police come together in one room and listen to one another. So the police will say, this is how we deal with your cases, this is how we act, this is what informs our thinking. And the women telling them, but this is what really happens to my life at a personal level when this happens to me. So I think those direct um, creating spaces, our role is to create those spaces for that to happen helps to start changing the thinking.